Hello. Um, I'm going to talk about Google Maps for mobile. And um, people might not realize this, but uh, usage growth on mobile devices is, going, is growing faster than usage on desktops. And furthermore, there are countries like India where there are more people accessing devices, uh, accessing the network and other network services from a mobile device than from desktops. A lot of people don't have access to desktops or laptops or whatever. The mobile device is their access to data services. So um, here's a screen snapshot. I took a web Google Maps a snapshot at 800 by 600. So this, these days we think of this as a small laptop. And you can see that the web version of Maps is already not tuned for this small of a screen. Uh, fairly, only maybe a third of the screen here is showing a map, which is kind of the main point is to see the map. Um, so, uh, and if you have, a, say, a Trio and you run the browser, you can, uh, you know, the Trio has 320 by 320 screen, which is fairly large for a uh, current mobile device, actually. And um, the web browser gives you, uh, you know, a version like this. You've got a small image of the map. It's static. You can't pan it. Uh, you have to scroll the, you know, the screen quite a bit just to uh, see any of the information you got at all. Um, so uh, right up the bat, you know, making this information available from local de mobile devices is a, um, is, is a UI scaling question. That's the way I think of it. And um, furthermore, you say, well, why does it matter? And the answer is, actually, maps and local search is something that's really good for when you're moving, when you're on the go, when you're traveling. Okay? A lot of the questions you ask are about the here and now or the nearby in space time. So um, on the left, we have some, uh, uh, basically a simulation of a more or less typical phone. And not only does it have a fairly small screen, but uh, your whole user input is, is sort of boiled down to uh, a dial pad and two soft keys and something, you know, little arrow keys, um, which is not a lot. There's not even any letter keys. So you have to multi-tap in uh, a name or an address. Um, but you can see at least that uh, we have scaled up the, we have re, you know, changed the UI so that almost the entire screen is map and a small number of overlays, for instance, labels for the two soft keys, and then some information. Uh, the yellow tooltip gives you some instructions about what to do, since you know, how do you know which button to push? It says six will go on to the next search result. Um, on the right, we have actually, uh, this is a Windows Mobile touchscreen device. It's a fairly large screen for, for uh, current devices. And um, if you want a keyboard, you have to tap the button. It pops up a keyboard to tap on. If you want uh, to see uh, you know, driving instructions, we switch to another screen where you can scroll through the instructions. Um, so you can see the main uh, adaptation we do here is changing the web AJAX application into a client server application. We write the client application that does the best job it can on the local device you have and sends a request to the server to get the information. Um, this well, I carry an iPhone, it has a very large screen. Um, and uh, another thing we do that's really important here is um, most phones these days can actually, the application can access the cell tower um, ID information. And by sending that to, the, to our servers, we can find out approximately where you are. And that means that you don't have to type an address just to get the map to about the right page and then start searching for you know, Starbucks or whatever you want to find. Um, and on the right is actually uh, what it looks like in uh, 2.0 version of iPhone if you have GPS. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about in general here, uh, the top level outline, is first of all just background on mobile networks. And mobile networks are a lot different than wired networks. Secondly, how do we cope with that? And then third, I'm going to talk about some other things that have something to do with scaling and mobile maps. So I took this data from um, 3G Americas, which is an industry association for uh, 3G cellular technologies. And um, the yellow line shows the uh, latency that it takes to get a packet through the wireless network. And the blue line shows the bandwidth you're getting through the 
wireless network as a function of these increasing um, GSM technologies. Um, I'm not sure to what degree these are, you know, really optimistic cases versus realistic measurements, but um, there's, there's this really typical pattern with technologies that the latency gets better at about the square root of the rate that the um, bandwidth gets better. Uh, Peter Denning has a talk where he explains uh, why he believes that's the case, but I'm just going to cite him and move on. Um, interesting thing to note here is, I mean, if you look at these, these latencies, and this is just to get one packet through. And, um, you know, 350 milliseconds is, is actually quite a bit of time from the user's perspective, and that's one direction, one packet. So if you're actually making an HTTP request from a web application, a uh, single request is going to take, you know, at least a couple of round trips. And, and, they, and both those round trips go, you know, through the wireless network. And sometimes there's more and so on. And then if you're talking about a typical web page, then you make some more round trips to get um, images and stuff like that. And if you're talking about an AJAX application, then you're continually making these round trips. And what we're measuring from a mobile application is like four and a quarter seconds of average latency. It's a, it's a lot of variability in this number, but um, from the user's point of view, that's just totally different than a wired network. Um, and furthermore, in the, in the uh, TCP scheme, uh, there's this exponential back off to deal with congestion in wired networks. And it's just totally the wrong thing to deal with packet loss in a wireless network. So you lose a packet and you wait and you wait longer. Um, and there's other interesting thing about Blackberries is that they're always on a VPN to uh, Waterloo where RIM's offices are, RIM's data centers are. And that means not only wherever you are in the world does the uh, packet have to go all the way to Waterloo and then to local Google data center or whatever, but um, the data is always encrypted and it seems to get delivered to the application pretty much all at once. So whereas the other phones can get the data piecemeal and start displaying map tiles or whatever, um, on the, on the uh, Blackberry you pretty much get the screen all at once when it finally comes in. All right, so how do we cope with this stuff? This is the architecture of uh, what we've built. There's a client application running in the phone, and it sends its packets, its requests through the wireless network, the carrier's network, through the internet, and on our servers. It comes in through load balancer, and then to our main server, the Google Maps for mobile server, um, which does some of the processing, but it passes other requests on to other backends that we have. Um, map search, local search that goes to one uh, server and, and many other servers behind it. The diagram for all these servers, if, if I were to show you, it wouldn't even fit on this page. Um, map tiles go to another server, those requests. Traffic goes to another server, location, so on. Um, so there's, there's two really interesting things about this. First of all, all these servers are stateless. So the question of how do we handle more and more you know, load, more and more usage is, well, we just roll out more servers. And the Google data center handles all the hard parts for us. So it does the load balancing. We've got logging and monitoring, all that stuff. Um, we just have to push some more servers out. Um, the second thing is uh, we avoid round trips as much as possible. We reduce them into a single trip. So the client sends one request and says, you know what? I need this and this and this map tile, and I need these and these traffic tiles. And all that gets multiplexed into one network request, goes to the server, get one answer. And as the uh, tiles come in, it puts them up on the screen. So we try and reduce the user's perceived latency, the user's actual experience latency, um, as much as possible. There are some phones that can you know, pipeline requests and some phones that can send parallel requests, but not all of them. So we had this big question up front, is what size map tile should we build, should we use in this thing? Um, Web Maps uses 128 by 128 tiles. Um, I'm sorry, they're using 256 by 256 pixel tiles. And um, so we said, okay, look, if you, you know, do a search and you jump to some new place and you have, let's, we started with a fairly small phone at the time, wanted to say, what if you, you know, what if you have a 130 by 180 screen and now you need to fetch the, all the tiles to fill that screen. And wherever the tile boundary is, there's going to be some amount of pixels around the edge. So the um, 
larger the tile size, the better the compression ratio is and the lower overhead there is per tile, but the more excess pixels you fetch. And the smaller tile, the better the users perceive actual kind of latency is because um, you start getting images on screen right away. Okay, the end result comes in at the same time, um, <clears throat> but you start being able to read the center of the map right away if you have small tiles. So um, it turns out that uh, in the measurements we did and the assumptions we made, which, which have evolved over time, a 22 by 22 pixel tile would be the optimal. And what we did was we move up one decibel and said, look, let's make them 64 by 64 tiles. Um, looking forward to larger screens at the time and um, figuring people do some amount of panning around. It was kind of a bit of heuristic here. But I do think that the notion of using you know, one decibel as a kind of general purpose measure of uh, a noticeable improvement, a useful level, and what, what, you know, where to draw the line is, is a good one. And I wonder what PowerPoint is doing my animations. <laughs> Anyway, um, we also adapted the ma map tiles. So uh, the first thing is you have a small screen, you need to have the road names more frequently because otherwise they're going to be you know, off screen. Furthermore, the pixels on mobile phones are smaller and getting smaller all the time. So they have to be at least somewhat larger. In fact, nowadays we have two sizes of text in the tiles. Um, and then we reduce the number of colors in order to compress this thing better. So there, you know, we took out the border lines along the streets. We use fewer um, base colors. Can't quite see it too well on this projection, but um, there's fewer base colors and fewer anti-aliasing colors and so on in order to compress them. Um, and then if you ask for a satellite image, some people say, well, why would you have satellite images on a mobile phone? You know, what are you going to do with that? And it, it's fun. And that's one reason. And the second reason is it's actually useful in certain cases. I mean, you know, you're going to go to this place and you say, well, where am I going to park? And the map doesn't show you anything like that. But the satellite image gives you a pretty good idea. So um, now the thing about satellite images is this is really much better use for JPEG than, than ping type decoding. JPEG has, the standard JPEG format has like a 600 byte, more than 600 byte header. And as a user, when you you know, compressing a JPEG, you pick one slider and you say, I want 75% compression, and that generates the entire 600 byte header. All these quantization tables and stuff like that. So we compact that back down to a tiny header and just send that. And out of a, like a 1700 byte uh, satellite image tile, that makes a significant difference. All right, so I'm going to talk briefly about some other dimensions. Um, so as you saw, scaling up and capacity actually isn't our problem. And um, uh, some of these other factors aren't a problem. But now I say, what is a problem? So this is, what, <laughs> this is a snapshot of a piece of our mobile testing lab. OK? You got to keep a lot of phones. They got to be charged up so you can test them. They got to have data plans. Um, <laughs> and they have different screen sizes. Yes, they do. Uh, a lot of these things have tiny you know, keyboards. Some of them have bigger keyboards. Um, this lab is growing maybe 10% a quarter. <laughs> the point where we actually don't keep them all powered up anymore. Um, and you need that, first of all, for testing. But uh, these things are running different operating systems. So um, these are our hard problems, actually. Is, uh, for, first of all, we have three different client code bases or three categories of operating systems. So there's a Java code base that runs on a whole bunch of Java phones, uh, Java Micro Edition on most of them, with the exception being Android. Um, Doja is some variation on Java Micro Edition. And then there's a C++ version that runs on Palm OS, Symbian, Windows Mobile, and so on. And the Objective-C version runs on iPhone. Um, that means we have three code bases to maintain in parallel and put new features in and so on. And that's something I wish we didn't have. Um, second thing is there are lots of models and makes variations of handsets. And um, carriers even take a standard handset from uh, one of the makers like Nokia and they, they ask for specific changes. They may take out the root certificates. They may modify the way the Java permissions work. They may you know, 
add and just take out features or whatever. Um, and so the way, um, let me step back just a second and explain how it works when you download an application to a Java phone. There's a file called a JAD file, which is basically an application descriptor. It's a properties file. And the phone fetches this thing and it says, OK, this is the URL for the main binary, the jar file. And you need this version of MIDP and this version of the Java VM. And you need uh, this much memory for it you know, to use. And there's some other properties in there. And we have to throw in other properties to say things like, um, you know what, the left soft key has this key code on this phone. Because there's no way to ask the phone that. Which is silly, but it was an oversight someplace. So we have a bunch of those properties in there we have to generate for each phone. Um, and the phone says, OK, uh, if I have those versions of those things, I can, I can handle a, an application this big. Then it goes back to the server and fetches the, the jar file and downloads that. Um, and uh, at one point, we had quite a few different jar files for each new release, as well as hundreds and hundreds of these JAD files for each phone model that we supported. Um, and now what we do is we, um, we've made some trade-off. So the jar files are larger. They have more variations in it for phones that might not be yours. And the JAD files we generate on the fly instead of storing hundreds of these things. So we just compose it on the fly from various pieces of information. Um, I'd say that our biggest challenge is country support. There's a lot of weirdness. There's a lot of unique things about different countries. So to name a few examples, um, there are specific laws. Uh, you know, China, we cannot export a specific, precise lat lawn of a location. So think about a mapping application where we can't talk in lat lawns from the client to server. <laughs> um, and then a few countries like China and uh, um, India have, have their own rules. Say, Here's where the borders must look like when you're inside our country. <laughs> so they dis disagree with the rest of the world, and then we have to have a different, you know, well, anyway, we're working on that one. Um, and then addresses are different. In, in uh, let's see, Japan and Russia, the addresses start at the top level and work down instead of the other way around. So this has an implication on when the user types an address, when we send an address to the phone, when you format it, when you put it into the address book. There's kind of extra complexities. Uh, phone numbers are interesting even. We send a phone number in a search result so that you can push a button and dial this business. You know, you just found some local business you want to dial it. There are people that live, you know, on the borders between countries and they want to be able to, you know, call that restaurant on the other side of the border and go there for dinner. Um, so they definitely need an international plus type phone number. And I would love to be able to just send the standard plus type phone number to um, every phone. But actually, that doesn't necessarily work on Sprint, for instance. Um, and we want it you know, to work for the local case, at least. So then we have this whole heuristic that says, well, I think I better send the local number for this phone. Or I'll send you know, the other number for another phone. Uh, terrain is interesting. If you are in um, Italy and you ask for some route along the coast and up into the Alps or whatever it is, it's a really, really long route with lots of little short steps in it. And that isn't. You know, that doesn't really fit our current UI, where you look at one step at a time. And so that, you know, that kind of thing needs extra attention. Um, and these phones have limited capacity for how big of a download they're willing to accept. And it, they, they vary from model to model. Um, so and when we you know, have localizations, we can't put 20 plus localizations in a single download. So what we have to do there is we now basically have, this is a minimal set of strings in there. And then once the app fires up, it contacts the server and says, OK, give me English, or give me Italian, or whatever it is. And then it gets the strings for that language, which is some delay in when you can actually do much of anything with the first time. But um, it means you could run the app in lots of languages.